Greetings, colleagues. David Violet here. I am a conference interpreter and uh, interpreter trainer in the San Francisco, California area. And I'd like to talk a little bit today about note-taking and about practicing note-taking. First of all, you all know as interpreters, you do need to take notes because you can't remember anything beyond a short piece of information. Sometimes the speaker will go for five minutes, seven, 10, 20 minutes, and either you cannot stop her from uh, just continuing, or it's not a good thing to do. If you keep cutting off the speaker, uh, she loses her train of thought and will not appreciate it. So it sort of ruins the whole uh, show, the whole effect. And you know, with RSI, it's even more difficult, of course, to stop someone. If someone is speaking on the microphone somewhere else in the world, the interpreter is not going to be heard and uh, it's going to be pretty much impossible to uh, ask the speaker, hey, could you stop here because I can't remember any more than uh, you know, a few sentences. So you need to have a good note-taking system, a good method, a good way of organizing your notes on the page. Most of all, you need to practice that uh, method uh, over many, many hours. Let me tell you what I think that uh, that practice actually does. It's not just what you end up with on the page. In other words, if you have fantastic symbols and they're all laid out in a, in a, nicely, that's, that's a good thing. But it's not going to do the job for you. It, it's actually the whole process of listening while you take notes, processing while you take notes, and fine-tuning your thinking as you take notes. And that fine-tuning, that um, ability to distinguish between things that initially sound sort of similar is a lot of what you gain through the many, many hours of practice during which a colleague will say, well, that's not wrong, that's not right, that's not what I heard. This becomes apparent when you try to put it into another language. I wanted, wanted to give you a few examples. It's, if somebody says uh, almost 100, over 100, about 100, exactly 100, north of 100, uh, approximately 100, those are not all the same thing. A couple of those are, are pretty much synonyms, but there are differences there. And so what you may write down is 100, but you also need to write down that nuance. That's whether it's below, exactly, above, etc. I have another example which uh, I remember when I was first starting in interpreting school. I, I remember, this is pretty stupid, but it was something about uh, economic growth, or no, it was about industrial growth. And in my rendition in the other language, I said something that was equivalent to economic growth. And when I was called on it, I thought, well, that's pretty much splitting hairs, isn't it? But it's not. It's a big difference. And let me think, let me ask you, as linguists, often we don't know so much about economics. What if somebody says growth in the economy, growth in commerce, growth in industry, growth in manufacturing, growth in the GDP, growth in production, growth in business? Now, you might reply, well, I just need to know the words, the equivalent words for all of those words. Well, that will frequently get you through, yes. But it's only getting you through. It's not really interpretation. Uh, okay, you might challenge me on that, but you really do need to think about what is going on and what are the differences between those things. You're going to have to do that in the process of finding equivalent terms. A dictionary or a good uh, glossary will frequently give you the good terms, good equivalents, but it's not a good habit. You should be thinking about what are these things. So for example, what's the difference between industry and commerce? Well, and production. Well, I'm not going to go into that, but you can see that it's different. And knowing the words in another language is sometimes what we are reduced to. But I say reduced to because 
we do want to understand what's being said and follow the reasoning if we can. Uh, often we can't, obviously. We're with a bunch of experts who are, have knowledge that we just don't have. But we are following as much as possible. For example, we are following the fact that it's growth and not a shrinking, and therefore it's a good thing or not a bad thing. We are not just saying words. We're understanding those things. Anyway, my main point today is that it's through practice that you are forced to say something and then have your colleague correct you and fine-tune your thinking and fine-tune the way you listen, note, and remember. That's a whole chain of events that it's like, I always compare it to driving a car. You have to, well, you don't shift gears anymore much. Well, in some countries you do. But you have to do so many things at once. And the only way to master that is through hours of practice. Okay, that's pretty much all I wanted to say today about note-taking. You do need to take notes or you will not be able to catch uh, portions that, that are five minutes, ten minutes long or even much longer. And if you do have a good note-taking method, which I teach, and you practice it a lot for maybe hours every week for many months, maybe a year. By having those two things, the, a good method and a lot of practice, you will be able to do beautiful consecutive five, ten minutes long. In fact, if you can do ten minutes, you could probably do 45 minutes. So I wish you every success with your consecutive with notes.